Right, we've now seen the duals of chain complexes and it's time to build the dual of homology. Let CD be a cochain complex over a field F as usual. Um, and here is the main definition. The kth cohomology group of this cochain complex. You get absolutely no prizes for guessing what this group is. Um, is defined to be the quotient vector space um, we'll write it as H upper K in keeping with our superscript indexing convention um, it's the kernel of the kth co-boundary map, quotient the image of the k minus first co-boundary map. Uh, this kernel is called the space of k co-cycles, and we'll call this the space of k co-boundaries. Although you should be warned uh, that uh, I think people might uh, tend to call it k minus one uh, co-boundaries. It's, uh, it's a whole thing, but this is the uh, the definition. And remember, because of duality, um, uh, the fact that a cochain complex uh, composing two consecutive co-boundary maps gives you zero, the images actually live inside the kernels as subspaces, so the quotient vector space makes sense. Um, okay, now um, I. I realize that this may not seem very enlightening. We've just taken a definition that we were beginning to understand, turned around all the arrows, and produced a new definition, just sort of purely from algebraic duality. Uh, so I think it's good if uh, people spend a little bit of time trying to understand what this object is measuring. Uh, but let me quickly remind you, so reminder, for a simplicial complex K there is uh, an associated cochain complex which I guess we should call simplicial cochain complex which um, looks something like this so the kth cochain group uh, how do we write this? Of K. This is um, the dual of the K chain group. Um, so, in particular, this means that its um, basis elements, uh, because the uh, chain group is uh, has as its basis elements all the simplices. So the basis elements are maps, sigma stars, sending k chains to the underlying field. And what does sigma star uh, do? Well, sigma is supposed to be a k simplex. And what sigma star does is it sends sigma to 1 and sends everything else in the basis to 0. So sigma star of a simplex tau is 1 if tau equals sigma and 0 otherwise. So this is sort of the simplest possible thing that could have happened. These are basis elements that look very similar to, um, to the basis elements that you had for the chains. Now, um, and we discussed in the previous lecture that the co-boundary map, uh, which gets a superscript indexing and goes from the k cochains to the k plus 1 cochains is just the transpose in this basis of the simplicial boundary map, which uh, I guess I should be extremely careful about which k's are big and which k's are little here. So there. Um, okay, so, um, and this of course is k 
minus one. So uh, remember, um, is it k minus one? No, I always get this wrong. This is k plus one. So this k plus one goes from um, the k plus one chains in k to the k chains in k. And of course, if you transposed it, you'd get exactly uh, the, the co-boundary map, but with a degree shift, as we discussed in the previous lecture. Okay, so um, much of the rest of this lecture, the goal is to give you some intuition for cohomology. So let's, um, let's do this uh, by building some sort of example. Uh, and so I imagine an annulus, and we've uh, sort of triangulated the living daylights out of it. Uh, is that a triangulation? No, still going. Uh, so this is a simplicial complex whose, yeah, maybe this is easier, isn't it? Um, whose geometric realization is basically it's an annulus. So the, the part in the middle is missing and everything else is there. And I am still triangulating it because I'm obsessed with it. But I will stop in a second when we reach the end. Okay, that's close enough. Maybe that's a triangulation. Okay, so what does a cochain look like? How should we think about a one cochain? So it's going to send some one chain to, um, it's going to take values on one chains basically. And to define it, we just have to figure out which basis elements, meaning which edges it sends to non-zero um, elements of the ground field F. And so um, you could imagine over Z mod two coefficients. Um, here, there is only one choice of non-zero object to send each edge to because the field only has zero or one. So in, at least over mod two, you could just write every cochain as by, by just indicating the edges, some subset of edges, that um, that must be sent to non-zero elements. So here is a cochain that sends one, two, three, four, five, those five edges I've just highlighted to one, and all the other edges in sight are sent to zero. So this is a perfectly good one cochain. Okay, so what's an example of a one uh, co-cycle? Let's get rid of this old cochain and think about what it will take to be a one co-cycle. Now, you want its co-boundary to vanish. You want it to be in the kernel of uh, the first co-boundary map. So let's imagine that, that this edge was sent to something non-zero uh, by your um, uh, by, by the cochain. That I mean, that's supposed to be a co-cycle. So the minute that edge is present with, again, we're working over mod two, so that edge is present with coefficient one. So that edge is being sent to one by our cochain. Uh, its co-boundary is going to include these two simplices. Why? Because the co-boundary map is a transpose of the second boundary map, and those two simplices are the only simplices which include our shaded edge in their boundary. So those two are going to show up in the co-boundary with a non-zero coefficient. Now, the minute these two simplices show up with a non-zero coefficient and you want the co-boundary to vanish, you need to add other edges that will cancel them out because over mod two, you just need one other edge. So you immediately take one other edge. So now you've just managed to kill uh, this simplex in the co-boundary, and then you take that edge and you kill that simplex in the co-boundary. But what happens as a result of introducing the first new edge is that this simplex shows up with a non-zero. Uh, and then you need to add another edge and so on. So you see being a cycle is sort of geometric condition. This thing has to keep going somehow, so we'll have to add this edge, this edge, etc. And eventually, you'll have to sort of come back, wind your way, and cancel everything out. So this is actually capturing a loop, but it's capturing a loop in a very different way from a chain. Uh, for a chain, you'd want the vertices to appear twice in the boundary of the edges. Here, we want the two simplices, the higher dimensional things to appear twice. So that's a one um, co-chain. And now, what's a co-boundary uh, supposed to look like? Well, it's just going to look like um, the co-boundary of a single vertex is sort of the easiest thing to look at. So the co-boundary of a vertex, let's pick a vertex in this triangulation, let's take that one. Its co-boundary are all the edges that show up um, 
which have this as uh, a boundary. So that's the co-boundary of, um, of that vertex. So now if you had a co-cycle that included, uh, let's say, these four edges, but not the other three, and then a whole bunch of other edges could be sent to non-zero things, and um, you replaced these four by the other three, uh, these three, uh, then the two co-cycles that you get by making this replacement will be in the same cohomology class because their difference happens to be this co-boundary. So that's one way of trying to visualize uh, cohomology uh, classes in simplicial complexes. Okay, but we don't have to spend too much time uh, visualizing if we don't want to. We can compute things fairly uh, concretely. Um, so here's a proposition. And now, uh, now that we have cohomology groups we probably uh, that are all vector spaces over F, we probably want to figure out what sorts of um, uh, what dimensions they have and whether they relate to the homology groups or not. So, um, if uh, like so, assume that C D is a cochain complex. obtained by dualizing a chain complex with the lower indexing. So the C upper K is the vector space dual of the C lower K, and the boundary maps are related by the transpose relation as before. Um, if the dimensions of the chain groups are finite, for all k, then it turns out that the dimension of the cohomology of this cochain complex is exactly the same as the dimension of the homology of the associated dual chain complex. So, how should one go around uh, go about proving this? Um, let's let's give this a shot. It's not a bad calculation at all. It just takes into account the fact that um, the chain groups have the same dimensions and that the boundary maps are transposes of the co-boundary maps. So let's start with homology because I guess we've known it for longer. Uh, so the dimension of HK is uh, going to be the uh, dimension of the kernel of DK minus the dimension of the image of the k plus one, the, the k plus one boundary map. So far, we haven't done any cohomology. We're just looking at the homology. And of course, this is uh, the dimension of the chain group. And now you see why we wanted this to be finite. I don't want anything to blow up and be infinite. So the dimension of ck minus the rank of this map dk. And then minus, uh, this is again the rank of dk plus one. Okay, now let's use the fact um, that the dimension of this CK is the same as the dimension of its dual because we have a dual basis, everything is finite. Um, and the rank of DK is the same as a rank of D upper K minus one uh, because they are related by uh, one is a transpose of the other, therefore they must have the same rank. So if you uh, include this information upstairs, uh, the dimension of the homology group becomes uh, this. You can replace the C lower K by the C upper K because of this. Uh, and now you have to be careful with the index shift. So this will become rank of DK minus one minus rank of D upper K. And now it just takes interchanging the two things you're subtracting. So uh, let's write that as CK. And so th these two I will switch. So let's first subtract rank of DK and then subtract rank of DK minus one. So all that's happened here is that we've done a little um, switch. Um, and of course, this bit uh, is just going to be, if you put it in uh, brackets, this is just uh, the kernel, the dimension of the kernel 
of uh, dk, and the other thing is just the dimension of the image of dk minus 1. So this is exactly the dimension of the kth cohomology group of the dual. OK, so this is where um, we arrive at a bit of an anticlimax. We went through a little bit of trouble. Uh, we dualized chain complexes to get cochain complexes, got a strange new notion of co-cycle, a strange new notion of co-boundary, tried to visualize it. And it turns out that after doing all of this work, uh, the actual dimensions of the cohomology groups that we get this way are no different from the dimensions of the homology groups that we would have got without dualizing or without doing any of this effort. So what's the advantage? Why would we even bother thinking about this? That's the subject of the next lecture.